Hi, this is Clifford Tarnicum again here uh, with Dr. Gwen Scott, a naturopathic doctor. And Gwen, thanks a whole lot for being here. Thank you. And we're here for the second time around uh, to present additional information regarding the condition that has been classified or called uh, Morgellons. I'll put it in quotes all the time. Uh, the more that uh, you listen to us, you may understand the reason for that. Uh, it appears to be very much a false characterization as a disease uh, that is restricted to a few individuals that we treat with some special disinterest um, as opposed to interest. And so today what I wanted to do on my side was just go into a little bit more detail, particularly visually. I would like um, the audience to be able to see uh, photographs of some of the forms, I have to call them pathogenic forms, I can come up with no other explanation. These are foreign to the human body. Uh, pathogenic forms that are being repeatedly identified over and over and over, whether an individual is manifesting this condition at the skin level or not. In fact, one of the characteristics is that these pathogenic forms, although originally uh, discovered and called to attention, by individuals that exhibited unusual skin conditions. The unfortunate finding is that these very same forms that are occurring even at the skin level are being found really across the board uh, within uh, essentially the, the broad population the way it is now. The number is up to 26 people that have performed a certain uh, test that we've talked about and we'll talk about more. All 26 of them are manifesting and the only, the only difference that I could characterized with the so-called Morgellons condition is that the degree or severity or extent of the um, pathogenic forms would appear to be greater. Uh, that's the furthest that I could go right now, but in terms of presence and distribution, uh, there is no exclusion right now of the general population uh, from what it is that is being discovered. So with that, what I wanted to do today was uh, use some of the time I had to present some photographs to you, and I'll overlay these photographs on the screen for you to see. And I want to go through the four forms that are being identified. My whole objective here is I want these things identified. That's just what this is about. It's not okay to say you're seeing something over and over in the human body that is clearly foreign uh, and causes um, ill conditions, disease, or ill health, whatever you want to call it within the human body, present this information publicly in a way that can be repeated over and over and over. Anything that I could do is quite easy. Um, to describe the methods. I won't say easy in terms of equipment. You need a good microscope here. But the fact is it's very much repeatable and could be done with anyone with adequate resources. It is my objective to have these four forms identified. I have mentioned them in the previous um, meeting you and I had, Gwen. Today I'd like to go over some of the photographs of these so you see them. These four forms that are being repeatedly identified are as follows. The first is what I call an enclosing or a bounding filament. Um, this filament um, will often exhibit itself, exhibit itself from skin lesions. This is true. This is how they were first discovered. Um, uh, in, the, in the sores that appear on the skin, an unusual fiber form can appear. Of course, a casual person might think it's a hair, and this would be an argument that might made initially. That won't hold up at all, will not hold up once you subject that to scrutiny or examination. The, first form is this bounding form. A human hair is on the order of roughly 60 to 100 microns thick. The fiber that is showing up here at the skin level is on the order of roughly, roughly 12 to 20 microns. It's not fixed. There's some variability, but roughly in the order of 12 to 20 microns thick. The photograph that I'm showing you now, um, you see the basically exterior, the full, the full size of that fiber. Now, what becomes unique then at this point is the second form. And the second form is contained, often contained, within this bounding or encasing filament. The second form is that of a submicron. Anytime you're dealing with things down at the submicron level, especially if you're breathing them, you certainly ought to, ought to have concern. We all know the attention that's been given to the presence of asbestos fibers in an environment, environment over the years. Asbestos fibers measure on the order of two microns. Uh, in thickness. If I start speaking to you of something that's being found, it shows every reason to be coming through um, uh, uh, airborne or respiratory methods coming into your system. At the submicron level, it certainly forms a basis for attention, investigation, and concern. And you will see within this bounding or encasing filament a submicron network. We're not talking about a single fiber. It is just absolutely packed 
with these submicron forms of parallel alignments of filaments. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about similarity of fungus a little bit later, but let's just get through the pictures first. So that's number one and two of the forms. Number three is, uh, technically we'll describe it as an oblate or a spherical structure. The best identification and the, and the size of this, size is important because it helps to identify um, um, microbiological forms. It's extremely important characteristic to be determined the size of something. You can often eliminate many things from consideration just by knowing the size alone. This particular oblate structure, best measurement I can come up with is on the order of roughly five tenths to seven tenths of a micron. The best identification that I can make, I'm not a medical doctor, I will repeat that, there is no diagnosis being made here, there is no medical prescription or advice being made, I'm acting as an independent researcher providing my analysis and observation for information to the public. But the best identifi identification I can make of this form is consideration of what is called chlamydia pneumonia, which is a rather exotic bacterial form. I am not saying this is chlamydia pneumonia. I am saying there are eight conditions that I have established that have been matched that would establish this as a leading contender for examination for identification. Remember, I'm after the identification. The best that I can do right now is provide the imagery to you to, to establish a path for investigation. But chlamydia pneumonia is a candidate. Chlamydia pneumonia is in a very unusual and rather exotic bacterial form. If you look at the classification schemes, it, classification schemes it's sort of totally separate from any uh, generic bacterial form. And one of the reasons that it is unique is that this particular bacterial form lives within cells, okay, intracellular. That is a remarkable property when you're talking about the immune system and its ability to detect the existence of a foreign element. If it's within the cell, you've complicated your problem a great deal. Chlamydia pneumonia is involved with many, many diseases um, that are certainly characteristic of our times. Uh, and that are increasing in frequency and distribution and let's say um, not exactly an explainable way. I will offer that as at least a leading contender not restricted to as a contender for examination or identification of these forms. And the last is what I have to call a hybrid form and it's simply because it's uh, somewhat unexplainable to me at this point what, what even form you're speaking of. Could be in the mycoplasma uh, category but it's basically a ribbon structure. Um, has some similarity to a filament network, but certainly not, not anything of the uniformity of the, of the second form that I've described to you. Um, and this particular form will exist also repeatedly within the blood samples that are being done. It's also true that these four forms are showing themselves across all major systems of the body. This is not something we're talking about that's restricted uh, to a skin fiber. All major systems of the body are repeatedly showing these forms. This includes the, the hair, the skin, the, the digestive system, the urinary system, saliva, ear. It is across the board throughout the human body that these forms are being um, found. The second important point here, that, that is the four forms that exist. The second point to, to make that's very important in this would be the link with the aerosol issue. And that is that there is, as of now, a rather direct physical link that has been established between these same forms that I have just uh, um, itemized for you that are being found in biological samples. There is an exact match with respect to form, size, shape, structure with environmental samples that have been repeatedly identified again uh, over the past 10 years. One of those samples in particular being sent to the United States Environmental Protection Agency for identification on behalf of the public welfare. The subsequent refusal of that agency to identify that material, let alone even acknowledge its existence. And of these four forms, three of them have crossed over directly into the environmental airborne a filament form. You have that encasing filament, you have the submicron network, and you have the what appears to be similar to a bacterial form uh, within that airborne environmental sample. So this is where um, a sufficient link and basis has been established for a connection between the environmental contaminants that we have been subject to in the aerosol operation and the subsequent manifestation in the biological form. 
The last one, and we'll come back maybe at the end, but I'm also going to put a photograph here of a uh, dental um, sample that you and I have talked about at rather great length, at least between us, involving a, a test, and it is a test. It is not a cure for anything, but it is a test that many people may wish to um, uh, perform involving the use of, of red wine and or negotiably um, uh, peroxide. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more, but certainly the original foundation was discovered by uh, um, Dr. Scott, Gwen Scott, uh, using wine, red wine, a deep dark red wine alone. And we can consider that somewhat of a, a gift at this point, but the, again, it is not a cure. We'll talk about that more at the end on your side since you're the one that discovered that. Uh, I have a couple more points I'd like to make today. The second one has to do with a conference that has been recently held. Apparently this conference was titled the first Morgellons Annual Conference, if I have that right, uh, held fairly recently. The conference appears to have called together uh, serious researchers and to give, um, let's say, credibility to the, um, to the issue of this um, emerging and or now pervasive um, condition. And it may be just that. It may be a first professional organization and presentation of information at that level. That's fine. Uh, on the same token, however, I'd like to at least, let's say, make the audience aware that we might want to monitor how information regarding the subject is presented to the public, um, especially being alert for information that is inconsistent, which, that, um, which has been established by independent means. One comment in particular that came out of this conference that caught my attention was a, a coverage was coverage by a CBS affiliate, affiliate. They went there on television there and covered this and um, said that they were the only television station to cover this event. They put a big headline on their television presentation that said, you know, this Morgellons condition, it may be that as many as 14,000 people across the world may have this condition and presented in somewhat of an astounding fashion. Unfortunately, the work that uh, Gwen and I have both worked on now uh, for really several years, but especially over the past several months with, uh, let's say, greater intensity, the unfortunate, unfortunate finding here is that the evidence and information indicates that we are speaking of something that is much of much broader distribution than you can imagine, that mentioning 14,000 people as containing certain uh, conditions is absolutely ludicrous from what I can see, and that the audience should seriously consider that the extent of what we are speaking of here may easily involve billions of people, and this is not an exaggeration. The majority of the population of the world may be under consideration here, and it is not fair in any way for any conference that is fairly considering the information to restrict this as some segregated group of unusual people that have something um, that we can push off for another two or years, two years as the CDC is trying to do. Third comment would be, well actually I've made this point um, strong enough already at this point, and that is the tie-in between what is being found biologically manifesting in the body and that of an environmental sample. I think I've made that point strong enough for today. The last comment would be that this information that has been presented publicly, open view under the, under the microscope with the best resources I have, has now been out there close to a year and a half. The first photographs of these unusual forms came out now close to a year and a half ago. To think that we're at the point that a year and a half later, with now rather intense work over the last several months, of presenting repeatable um, images that show uh, very unusual forms, which appear by all means to be pathogenic, and to not have those forms positively identified is absolutely atrocious. There is no excuse for this whatsoever, and it is one of my primary objectives at this point. We'll go further later on, but at this point there's absolutely no excuse for having these four specific forms. This is a minimum, four specific forms identified as to nature and function. And in fact, um, out of the conference that is going on, it's, it's, um, it's really not very sensible that, oh, we're now getting to the point where we can see some images on this. We've had some images now for at least a year and a half. So this is, this is my primary calling at this point. Get these things identified, and then we'll go further in terms of understanding what the effect is. And with that, oh, and the last thing was that there has been. There has been no suitable identification thus far. It's totally, totally void, basically, of of clarity 
um, and definition. And with that last comment, I'd like to pass things over to you, Gwen. I hope I didn't infringe on your time there too much, no, but we're no, going to no, do no, this no. again as, as much as we need to to get the information out. So I thank you very Take much. all the time you want, Thanks. my friend. Um, okay, I had some new developments using my own body laboratory, which is what I've been doing all along, and friends and family and whatever. Uh, but before I talk about that, I will say since our last discussion, I did have a gentleman who was involved in the design of some of this call me and when he, when he was involved he said you know he felt he was doing something to help the soldiers in the field in this country. They, he was told that these things would be sprayed, aerosol sprayed from planes on the enemy and they would save soldiers lives and then it occurred to him when he became aware and began to see uh, Clifford's work and other work that oops you know maybe that's not the case. So now he's trying really hard to help out anybody that he can find that's trying to do the work. And he explained something to me that I knew but I had kind of forgotten, which is every organ in your body has a specific frequency. And it, it, it operates at that frequency. And when you interrupt that frequency electromagnetically, you can create all kinds of serious, even unto death, problems. He also talked about areas of the brain um, and mind control. And uh, as Orwellian as that may seem, apparently scientifically it's very real. And we know from Clifford's work uh, for years now, the electromagnetic properties of what's happening in our air supply as a result of the aerosol spraying and the manipulation of that. Beyond that, he talked about and confirmed to me the heavy metals, the barium, the titanium, um, the aluminum, uh, none of which, trust me, are good for the human, uh, the fibers. He felt that the fibers were metallic in nature. Uh, he talked about the biological. He said all of it has been altered. Uh, some of it, uh, and Clifford alluded to it earlier, can kind of escape your immune system, cloak itself in one form or another. Um, again, the electromagnetics and also the lack of oxygen, the displacement of oxygen. And Clifford talked about that at the beginning of his work, that the more you displace or rid oxygen out of the air supply with particulates, it could be cornflakes, it doesn't matter, mortality rates go up concurrently. And we are operating on a very low level of oxygen because of the displacement. So that alone doesn't, you know, it, it, forget all the components. That alone is very detrimental uh, to the human body. And as Clifford was talking about earlier, um, the red blood cell whose job it is to carry oxygen has been compromised. So we, we, it's actually pretty amazing that any of us are walking and talking. An article was brought to me, done by a research doctor in the 50s, talking about a condition called dysbiosis, which is uh, fungal overgrowth in the human body and what happens to the body, to the organs, to the person as, as that fungus, which is very aggressive and in those days probably just candida, uh, overtakes the human body and the resulting nanobacteria on and on and on that come out of that kind of circumstance which he blamed primarily on the use of antibiotics. I'm seeing, I believe, uh, something very similar to that where people literally fail because the fungus overtakes. I do have a friend who's a surgeon who told me they have opened people up now in operating rooms and closed them back up because their organs are so covered with this fungal matter they can't find the organs. So I feel assured that's at least a component with that in mind, folks, fungus does not do well if you don't feed it sugar. And I know that's hard news for a lot of people who love their sweets. But fungus cannot survive in a sugar-free environment, or at least average fungus, we don't know. But it would be something to consider to try to eliminate all sweets. If you can't do a little raw honey, that would be the best option. But sugar feeds this problem, so something to think about. And again, I am a naturopathic doctor, but most states do not license me. And that means I cannot diagnose, nor can I prescribe. 
what I'm doing here is informing you, which I am allowed to do, educate and inform through empirical uh, observation of self and people that I have worked with. But I am not. You need to find a good, enlightened practitioner. Feel free to share any and all information that I'm sharing with you with the practitioner, either her or him, uh, and work together that way with a professional. I wouldn't try to cowboy this circumstance. I've done it, and I've brought myself right to the uh, ragged edge of <laughs> the great beyond, so don't do that. I'm trying to run ahead, and I'm slamming myself pretty hard with a lot of different things to see what's in here, to see how I can help mitigate the process for other people. As Clifford said, and I do believe he's right, um, pretty much everybody I know has some form of involvement and it can be very easily determined through blood sample, uh, the, sp the wine spit test um, where you just rinse your mouth with deep red wine uh, and spit. Um, so that said, when you begin to follow Herring's Law of Cure, which is brilliant, top to bottom, in to out, cure, in to out and in the reverse order in which it came in, you begin to demonstrate on a topical level, and I've had a lot of people get in touch with me with these horrible rashes, itchy, burning, stinging like glass shards, and I'm very familiar with that. <coughs> I'm currently dealing with it because I've been pushing very, very hard. Um, and I will tell you, I have found something that helps mitigate it dramatically. But before I go further, it occurred to me today, why I don't know, to get the black light out and look at, because it seemed it was pretty shiny, uh, all this rash. And sure enough, it, it's luminescent. Um, so there is a luminescent material, either plastic, some people have suggested silicone, that is integrated into this whole system with the fibers and perhaps the bacteria and fungus and all of this that's presenting itself uh, pretty much all over my body now as a rash, a very painful rash. So uh, it's, it's, it's fluorescent, go figure, uh, not normal to the human body. Um, people, I did talk about this in my paper, uh, black light with the uh, pupils, be very careful with your eyes. You don't want to do that with a black light for very long at all because you can burn your retina. But you can see very quickly if your pupils are luminescent. I haven't found a human yet that it isn't true. Um, on CNN, very quickly, uh, some of this came to light uh, with Anderson Cooper. He did a, a series called Planet in Peril. And in that he had his blood tested. And uh, very surprising to him and everyone else is he came back with very high plastic and they sort of dismissed that as oh microwaving with plastic and all of that. Well I can promise you I do not microwave, period, plastic or no plastic. Um, very careful, I store most of my food in glass and I can go on and on. So, and I've been driving and had huge globs of clear liquid hit my windshield and you know you try to wash it off and it smears, smears, smears. So I have a pretty good idea, I think, of where that might be coming from. I will get to the mitigation of the rash, but I do want to say I've noticed that a lot of people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s now need joint replacement, knees, hips, even a thumb, I heard, and shoulder. I thought, what's going on here? These are fairly healthy people, have not abused, they're not marathon runners, they haven't, you know, repeated trauma. Why is everybody needing this? A uh, friend made a joke, the uh, 60s, the new 80, not very funny. Um, and I'm beginning to understand because in this last big push of pushing this, these pathogens out of my system, uh, they first came out in hordes of uh, elbows, knees, ankles, in other words, hips, joints. And I can't help but think, I have no proof, but they were residing in those areas and perhaps causing me a lot of problem and maybe the degradation um, of, of those joints. It certainly doesn't have to do with, are you taking a calcium supplement? Believe me, calcium does not even go into cartilage, so neither does blood. So it's, it's something getting into the cartilage, maybe the synovial fluids, and compromising those systems. Best out, best to get these things out. Some things I have found helpful, we'll get to the helpful part here, uh, full spectrum digestive enzymes seem to be very helpful because a lot of people are having gastrointestinal concerns. So your local health store should have 
uh, full spectrum digestive enzymes. Again, Please avoid all sugar, and you probably want to add in garlic is an excellent antifungal. Um, well, garlic's full spectrum, antibacterial, antifungal. It's really good if you can find those things and hit everybody at once. Um, garlic, Paldiarco tea and capsules I found very helpful. Um, there is a company called Herbs Etc. I mentioned in my paper on Clifford's site that makes a couple of extracts that I found very helpful. And to mitigate the rash, believe it or not, I went into Walgreens and there was a lovely young woman in there. And she said, oh, I, and she knows I'm a naturopath. I have a new cream from Israel and it's, it's all natural and it, it, it's, it's wonderful. And this is what it's called. It's called Yes to Carrots. Now, I don't have any financial connection with this whatsoever or any product I ever talk about. Okay, let's just get that straight. And it's called Yes to Carrots, and it's a cream. And she, that day my arm was on fire. I felt like I was strapped on a, a mound of fire ants. And I put it on, and it will sting. It stung for about 30 seconds. But then everything went quiet, and it was truly blessed relief. And I guess that's, that's five or six days ago. And uh, I've found a great deal of relief with the rash, the attending rash, with this product. I've tried many, many other things, and this did the best job. And finally, there was a gentleman who emailed Clifford saying, look, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a recovering alcoholic, I can't put the red wine in my mouth and swish it around. Uh, is there anything else to do? And I thought, gosh, I wish I thought of that, and I apologize. Oh, this is my pal, Gabriel, <laughs> bringing some love to the proceedings. Um, <laughs> anyway... Um, I thought about it, and I don't know if the alcohol has that much significance. It might be uh, the tannin in the grape. It could be the revesertol in the uh, skin of the grape. I'm not sure. But it might be worth it to try purple grape juice. Now, I, between now and the next time we meet, I will get some purple grape juice and give it a shot. But for those who are uh, alcohol restricted, it's at least a thought to try that. I'm sorry I didn't think of that before, but you could try some purple grape juice for the mouth swishing and see if that helps. And I'll do it myself and, and then talk about it next time. Um, so in closing, um, as hard as it may be, uh, it's really true, better out than in. Uh, these things are not normal or natural to your body. They are not assisting your body. Um, and I have a feeling there's a laundry list of ways that these things are harming us in ways that we cannot even begin to understand. So the process at this point has been difficult and painful for me, and I'm trying to get ahead of it so that when people do start to cleanse themselves of that which does not belong in the human body, that I can have found some mitigating things to make it less painful, less difficult. I pray that there's something that it could ha we could do and there'd be no uh, pain or problem. I'm not sure that's achievable, but at least to knock it down where the average person could deal with this cleansing of the unknowns, fibers, and Lord mercy, uh, out of the body. And if you read my paper, I do make suggestions uh, about my own journey to this point in time. Gwen, I wanted to thank you for all that work that you're doing. I hope that people do uh, realize the contributions that are, have been made here uh, by Gwen on uh, trying to get uh, methods that are accessible to us, accessible yeah. and affordable to us, and uh, there's a great deal that uh, um, is to be appreciated. You know, in our, in our closing, there's just a couple comments I wanted to make. Um, uh, one with respect to the fungal question. It's an interesting question to me because I have to go by identification and try to use the conventional forms of conventional resources even though there is a strong reason to believe that we're dealing with things that are unconventional um, and, and not in the standard books. But nevertheless, this question of the fungus has, has been there for some time. And even though it is true, I cannot, this, particularly this uh, submicron filament form, although I cannot attach it at this point, to any conventional or known fungal form, it's still, nevertheless, in terms of if we look at the, the behavior and characteristics and style of this form, it certainly has 
uh, many characteristics that would be aligned with the fungal characteristics. You know, we don't know the final answer, but we know we're coming from different sides. But we're trying to merge this information over time. And, you know, I'm amazed by the tenacity and persistence of this material. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I have, it's been to the point now we're on the wine test, which I want to talk about in just a minute. It, the amount of material produced it has actually been enough to clog up a sink. Uh, it's, it's very uh, unfortunate, but it's, it's, it's a fact that we're talking about a, a significant amount of material that can be seen. And with that, I wanted to reiterate um, uh, the question of whether or not you would like to perform this test that Dr. Scott has established and discovered. And it is a test. It is not a cure at all. For those that are refusing to disclose this information because they're worried about liability, you... There is no concern on my side about presenting the factual truth, and especially if, if it's observable and repeatable. And this is a test that you have discovered and established, which leads one to, to ask for themselves and to answer the question for themselves as to whether or not the issue that we're speaking of is real. And I'm going to put a photograph up here at the end that shows the results of that test, and it's quite simple. You know, using uh, the wine as you described, people can look at the site or your paper, uh, but it's basically uh, uh, swishing, gargling your mouth with a dark red wine. Uh, again, controversial with the peroxide thing, whatever the mix is. But this is real physical material that we're speaking of. Which and you have sampled and shown under a microscope. Uh, repeatedly. This is not something that, that's anomalous at this stage. Right. We're up to 26 people that have voluntarily uh, performed this test. Unfortunately, all 26 of them are showing the presence. And this is a question that I ask you, to you. If, if you do not think that the general population, the broader population is involved in this issue, I urge you to consider uh, performing this test. If you do find that uh, your gums and mouth expel any material, uh, solid material of a fibrous or stringy network after you perform this test, I encourage you to start asking some very serious questions. What is the nature of that material? Why is it there? And then also, you figure out how to get rid of it, and we've made some progress. And, and with that, um, I wanted to thank you very much, thank Glenn, you. for being here thank again, the second in a series, and I hope to continue, and we'll get the information out as best as we can. And, and thank you very much.